So welcome. I'm going to share um, kind of our lineup for the next four months, and um, uh, the and then we'll hand it over to Daniel, uh, who will be stimulating us in our perception of the world and our response to it. Um, hi, Christine. Good to have you on the call. Um, so in March on March 19th, Helen um, Syrota. I might not be pronouncing her last name quite perfectly, but she is calling, she's going to be sharing from the UK. Uh, she is a, a business owner and runs her own uh, consulting group called Wise Goose Consulting. And she um, has been experimenting for the last year or so with integrating the inner development goals that have come out of the UN to complement the sustainability goals that the UN has put together and talking about how she's been uh, experimenting with um, that human development framework in her coaching practice and her organization development practice. And then, uh, so that's March 19th, uh, same time, same place. And then uh, April 16th, Catherine Tyler Scott's going to join us. She's, she's also a business owner and consult OD consultant out of uh, Indianapolis doing great systems change work. But she's going to, she hasn't quite fully landed on her topic, but she has um, been eloquent in her understanding of the dynamics of what happens in highly anxious systems, which is kind of the world we're living in these days. And what happens, how that erodes leadership and the strength of leadership um, and uh, the other uh, topic that will kind of inform her conversation will be really what is the moment that we're facing and what might our response need to be. So that'll be April 16th. And then in May, um, Amon Mellis, who's out of uh, Toronto, uh, he's going to be sharing uh, the results from an African-centric leadership program or gathering that the UN has called for in April. And so he's gonna be sharing insights from that. And then in June, David Langaro, Gl Gl Langimo is, um, has been doing research on destructive leadership. And what's it look like and what's its impact on individuals in organizations and in organizations in general. And so that'll be uh, June 18th. So that's our lineup. And but what's today, the date in May? May uh, 21st with Amon. Thanks. Um, but today I get to introduce my good friend, Daniel Wahasi, who's uh, going to share um, some of the key themes and identifications that come out of a book called Ishmael. And I will let him deepen it. But it's, we talked, we found, um, we kind of selected this topic because it seems like even though it's a book that's been around for quite a while, it's uh, the content of the book is still very, very relevant and helps us make meaning in terms of what's happening today. So I will hand it over to Daniel. So thank you for sharing, Daniel. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. I am so excited to share this and uh, wrestle with some of the philosophical underpinnings of this book, because for me, I read this book probably about 20 years ago. It was published in 1992, so it's about 30 years old, by Daniel Quinn. It's Ishmael. Oh, apologies for the blur. Um, by Daniel Quinn. And uh, so I read it in my college years or shortly thereafter, and it fundamentally helped me see the world differently. And you'll understand why here in a moment. And so I recently reread this book and remembered how much I have actually embodied what I learned when I read this 20 years ago. And it's been interesting to witness the evolution of when this book first comes out, because there, at the end of it, there is a call to action saying that if you think that shifts are needed in the world that we've identified, go out and share this. And another interesting connection point here is one of our clients is a private sector firm that provides retail and food service for a bunch of cultural institutions like zoos, aquariums, and museums. They're in the magnitude of three to 400 million a year. 
and they're in like 80 to 90 different cultural sites. So they're big and they give free copies of this book to everybody that wants one. They have like a stack of six to 10 of them in their bo executive boardroom in their admin office headquarters in Denver. And I was surprised, pleasantly surprised that they are willing to dance into this territory because their business model is very much a, a normal business model of selling food and selling things in gift shops, retail things. And some of it, there's some good philosophical conundrums that they hold around. Well, our business model is to sell people souvenirs, but what are the environmental and sustainability impacts of that? And how much plastic do we have that's single use and not, and they've made huge strides in reducing single use plastic in their gift shops um, in producing and or uh, connecting more with sustainable food sources and local food sources in their culinary um, delivery, but they still have a ways to go. And the fact that they're willing to wrestle with this kind of philosophical framework is really lovely. So let me get into the story. It's this really fun Socratic method where the teacher is a gorilla named Ishmael who communicates telepathically to the main character who basically responds to an ad in the paper that says teacher seeking student who wants to change the world. And the guy is reading and he's like, I don't know, this seems ridiculous. This is just, you know, is this really gonna help? But he was, he was seeking for something more meaningful in his life. So there's this really fun dynamic between a gorilla that you're surprised is, is there and then actually is a teacher. And the gorilla's story is one of captivity as it was captured from the wild and grew up in captivity, but then a generous person purchased him, fed him, gave him more freedom, and taught him how to think in English and communicate. So that's just a fun little trope that they use within the book to convey these deeper messages. But fundamentally, Ishmael teaches us that there are two cultural myths that we hold as humans. One is that of the takers, who are, quote, civilized, and the leavers, who are, quote, primitive. Um, keeping in mind, this was written in the early 90s, so there's been a lot of evolution in language, and this is, you know, he always uses man instead of humankind. Um, and this idea that most humans today, even in the early 90s, are takers. And the takers have this four fundamental belief systems that lead to how they show up in the world. And so I want to start by asking you to lean into the Socratic method a little bit. If one of you would give me the elevator pitch of the creation story, what is, what is creation? If somebody asked you to explain how the world has come to be what it is, how would you respond? You, you mean the Adam and Eve story, Daniel? You you decide. I'm not directing you one way or another. Once there was a god, and uh, he spent seven days to create everything. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's one way. Uh, what's a more scientific way to describe where we are? Big bang. Big bang, and then what? Organisms evolution. Evolution. So big bang, solar systems, planets, organisms, and then and then what? What kind of organisms? Cells. Cells and then moss. And then <laughs> like bring us bring us to today. Get us there. What are a few other big steps? Frogs. Cell. Frogs and birds. Reptiles and yeah. Yeah, and then mammals. Cavemen and mammals and cavemen and multi cell reproduction. Monkeys mm. and reproduction, yeah. plants and things. And, fire. and how do we get Beatles. to fire? <laughs> there we go. Plane strains and automobiles. <laughs> there you go. And then we have the thing. <laughs> and then chat GPT. We're all caught. Chat GPT. Up. There you go. All right. Technology, machines. <laughs> And so the, it's interesting, and I, I kind of seeded this by I said, how did we get to today? But in the telling of that story, let's ask that same question, but go back half a billion years. 
And it goes big bang, solar systems, planets, organisms, single cell, multicellular. And then we get to this great species that is the jellyfish. And that's it. We're at the jellyfish. But we know that there's more to the story because we're here half a billion years later. But when we tell this story, we often tell the story as humans, us are the pinnacle of creation. So asking ourselves, where are we at in the story? Most humans and the, the cultural mythos that we are surrounded by, whether it's uh, economic myth or a religious myth, we are the end of the story. We can't imagine a hundred million years, half a billion years forward, what we are going to turn into, what organisms are going to come after us, what the world is going to look like after us. But in fact, we're not the end of the story, right? Just like the jellyfish weren't the end of the story half a billion years ago. So one of the fundamental assumptions that most, that takers uh, have is that humans are the pinnacle of creation. And if we're the pinnacle of creation, it's easy to follow that the world around us is made for us. We're the best, we're the end, the world's here for us. And not only is the world here for us, but when we look at it, we recognize that it's unruly, it's wild, it's dangerous. So who better to bring it under control and conquer it than us? So humans are the pinnacle of creation. The world is made for humans. The world is was created in an unruly fashion. And we humans are made to conquer and rule the world. Those four assumptions are deeply embedded in the cultural soup that most civilized cultures, or perhaps this book would probably argue all civilized cultures, as we define that, uh, hold. So what are a couple impacts of assuming that we're the pinnacle of creation, that the world is for us, that it's unruly and we have to con conquer it to control it? What happens when we see the world in that way? We One separate ourselves. That... Sorry. We separate ourselves from everything else on the planet. Yes, we're separate from. What were you going to say, Mary Ellen? That in addition to being separate, um, which I agree with, I think we also believe that we are not a part of nature. Um, and yet, when we talk about going out into nature, we are nature. So I think that becomes, we need to make that more extrinsic. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, These are it, actually, it, oh, go, go ahead, Kathy. It also introduces the, um, the whole hierarchy of who counts and who doesn't count in the system. Right. So humans are at the top. Therefore, you know, what are the rights and privileges of people at the top of the system, so to speak? You know, that's where you you get to do anything that serves you better. Yeah. I love it. We'll dig into that a little bit more and apply it, uh, but I want to share a little bit more context. So you can imagine then that the levers are opposite, right? They they understand that they're in the middle of the story, that humans are not the pinnacle of creation, that the world isn't actually made for us, but we are part of the world. We are interconnected. We are part of nature. And that the world is actually not unruly and wild. And so it doesn't need any control, that if we can live in harmony with it, with nature, with life, uh, then we can continue onward. And that... Since it's not unruly, it just has its own dynamics of cyclical and open systems and, and change that nobody needs to conquer it. We don't need to conquer it. And looking at nature, we see species having these characteristics. No species is out there saying we're the pinnacle and trying to conquer the world. So another way to help understand what, what creates this taker mindset is by observing what are three things that takers do 
that no other species does. And it's it's a really fun read because Ishmael will not give the, the um, main character the answers. He is very much the Socratic method of asking, why don't you go observe? Oh, here's an example. Why, why don't you go back and, and come back in a day or two and tell me what you think the answer to my question is? So it's kind of fun. And the, the uh, main character gets really frustrated because he's fully embedded in this taker culture, civilization. And so it's fun to, to watch him wrestle. So I'm just going to give it to you because we don't have time to go through all of that. But there are three things that takers do that no other species does. Number one, they exterminate their competition. There is not a species that goes out there and exterminates their competition. They will defend themselves from threat, from attack, and they will hunt for the purpose of eating. But takers, uh, these, these are just examples, I'm not picking on anybody, but farmers and ranchers will kill fox, coyotes. Farmers will kill birds that are coming to take their crops or the, the carnivores coming to take their herds of animals because that's their property, that is their thing that they've cultivated and created control around. And they're not going to eat the food. They're not going to eat the competition. They just kill them because it's threatening their, their food source. And it's fascinating because he points out how so much of this is around food. So not only will takers destroy their competition, they will also, number two, systematically destroy their competitors' food to make room for their own. We've wiped out prairies so that we can plant monoculture. We've wiped out forests so that we can graze cattle. So going from polyculture and complex systems to monoculture and simple systems. In nature, there is no species that just systematically destroys a competitor's food source just to make room for their own. They take what they need and they leave the rest alone. Now, as populations grow in a species, they are consuming more of the food that they want, but they are not systematically going and capturing land away from another species and transforming it to their own food source only. Um, and then the third thing that takers do that no other species does is they deny competitors access to food. Now, they will protect food that they're eating, right? The lion who's eating the carcass is going to run off anybody who's trying to come and get, at, get it from it. But it's not gonna prevent other animals from going and getting a different gazelle or the, the savanna ecosystem where the gazelle was roaming. Whereas takers will literally build walls put fences around their gardens to keep competitors out. As humans, I can't go onto somebody else's personal property and take that food. It literally is somebody else's. I would get arrested. And systematically, if you think of civilization over time, just a second, Mary Ellen, the takers have taken over the leaver's land. Think of indigenous people. We've taken their land and we've, deny them access to what used to be their food sources by privatization. Yeah, Mary Ellen, you got a question. Yeah, you provoked me um, into realizing that another thing that the takers do, which no other species does that I can think of is we kill for sport. Um, I don't even think I would call them competitors. We just shoot, fish, um, do whatever's necessary and what we think is necessary and um, leave the, the leavings. So we decimate whole populations with no other remorse or consideration. And we have done so into extinction. And, yeah, uh, we have well, exterminated not just competitors, but for the sake of sport. Yep. And, and if you look at the uh, wars and the conflicts that are going on, you see the same thinking pattern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those are kind of some fundamental underpinnings of the taker culture that we are all a part of. 
Um, and the lever culture, the kind of the arc of the story then at the very end is the levers are the ones living in harmony. They have a better cultural story and understanding of reality that is in line with life living systems. We talk about that a lot on these regenerative calls. And so how can we live more like levers? I'm going to touch on just one thing that I found fascinating because Frank, you mentioned the creation story, right? From Christian tradition, Christian and uh, Jewish tradition um, and Islamic tradition too of Adam and Eve. And Daniel Quinn posits that that creation story was actually not written by takers trying to explain their fall and their uh, relationship with God and original sin, but that it was written by leavers who were watching the takers in the agricultural revolution, systematically destroying their competition, keeping competitors away from their food and denying competitors access to food, denying them. And in the fall, it's the Adam and Eve, when they eat from the tree of uh, good and evil of knowledge, they then know who should live and who should die, or they think they do, right? And they are banished out of the garden of paradise where everything is provided to toil in the fields and labor. So why is it that the story talks about laboring and basically agriculture as the fall and the punishment if it was written by the takers? So he thinks that it's possible that Levers actually wrote that story to describe that the agricultural revolution and tilling of the soil and keeping of animal husbandry was the fall that separated us from nature, from God. And then there's another piece in there um, with Cain and Abel where, and I didn't write this down and I don't remember that story directly, but the one who is murdered is the nomadic one, not the farmer. And so wondering too, if that story was written as a way for the leavers, the nomadic, those living more in harmony with nature, trying to explain what they saw happening. And when those oral traditions eventually got written down, they got adopted by the takers and created some of these religious myths that live forward today. So it's interesting to see that piece being brought into and, and so much of at least Western culture is based in one of those Christian, Jewish or Islamic traditions, the Abrahamic traditions. Um, I'm seeing some chats. Our focus on power and control is actually about the assumptions behind the behavior. Yeah, interesting, interesting wanderings. So, and the last thing I'll share is a quote that comes a little bit in the, um, toward the end of the book, because talking about this idea of the gods having wisdom and that the takers have tried to have that wisdom, uh, the, the quote is, man can never have the wisdom the gods use to rule the world. And if he tries to preempt that wisdom, the result won't be enlightenment, it will be death. When we think that we can control this unruly world that was created for us and we're the pinnacle of, the only result will be death. It's only when we humble ourselves and recognize we're part of the system, shift from separate to interconnected, shift from the end of the story to we're still in the middle of the story, it's still unfolding in will. That's when we can live and create life. And it reminds me of the biomimicry, the fundamental assumption of biomimicry is that nature creates conditions conducive to life. We've talked about that. Some of you have heard that on a previous call, that when you look to nature, the genetic code has a strong desire to continue through reproduction. And not just that, but you don't see species soiling their nests. It's not natural for them to destroy the environment that sustains them. Nature creates conditions conducive to life so that their DNA, their genes, their continuation can happen. So I'm gonna pause there, ask for clarifying questions. Um, if there's, uh, Chris, you said you've read the book recently. Um, if there's anything that you want to add or if there are questions from others to clarify and then Steph is gonna facilitate a couple questions, provocative questions that we can discuss as a group. Unmute yourself. Well, one of the things um, 
that I'm excited to discuss with my students on Friday. Uh, we have our, our final book discussion and um, seniors are um, take turns facilitating it. So the students have, have a, um, agency in that. And we're gonna be talking about um, kind of the narrative around this myth and why is it structured in this way where Ishmael isn't just giving giving it to the narrator, it, it really requires the narrator to be active and engaged and thinking and participating. And um, so I, I'm thinking a lot about, and that's part of why I've structured the seniors to, to guide the discussion. So it's not just me giving it to them, but they have to be active and engaged. And, and this, is, this is what's required to live in a different way. We have to be active and engaged in um, finding, I got a phone ring, I'm so sorry, uh, find, finding different ways. And I'm wondering if there are immediate um, parallels to, um, or just guidance to, in, in, you know, it was one of the tensions. He's like, Ishmael asked the narrator, like, do you think the takers are interested in this? Do you think they're they're open to change? Do you think that's kind of like well, no. <laughs> um, so it's like how do we inspire that kind of engagement that's required? Because it's painful sometimes as you're reading it. You're like, come on, give me the answer, man. Like, seems like you're holding this really important information. Why won't you just give it to me? But it requires this wrestling and and agency that um, in a culture of immediate. Um, satisfaction is not readily uh, accessed or practiced. So I'm I'm curious if if folks have thoughts about how how we create a, a culture where we move toward in that kind of engagement, even if it's not um, comfortable. That's a lovely question. Uh, it reminds me of a couple things. One, the Socratic method works. It's called that for a reason, and it's lasted this long because it works when people come up with their own answers to the questions, they're more invested in it. Kathy has a saying, I think I learned it from you, that people participate in what they help create. And so if you want to create a new reality, a new vision for how the world works, they've got to participate in that. If they're just told, go live like leavers, stop believing all these things that are just fundamental assumptions of your culture, it goes one in one ear and out the other. There's a lot of brain science too around that, right? If you're just being talked at, you're not actively participating. And it takes a lot more times of being repeated to you before it sticks. But if you actively engage and wrestle with it, then you're going to help create that world or create that change. Other people have thoughts to Chris's inquiry? I think Chris... Um... What's interesting is, is if you think about it from a photosynthesis point of view, sunlight is a free resource, but it requires active engagement of leaves to turn that energy into food um, that fuels all of life on the planet. So without that active engagement, nothing happens. Um, Frank and I had this interesting conversation uh, last week where I was, woke up one day last week thinking about um, how photosynthesis is um, and has been for many, many billions of years, an invisible process that was critical to all life on the planet. And uh, so it caused me to do a little research on when did we understand photosynthesis and its critical essential role in life. And it wasn't until 1930s that we finally figured out the formula of photosynthesis and that was an over 200 year journey by multiple scientists to get there. And then the question I asked Frank was, do you, what, what other pro critical processes do you think there are in organizations that are totally invisible to us, but have that same uh, critical essence in order to uh, sustain future life? And Frank introduced me to Arnold Mandel, and maybe you could talk, Frank, what what, what that part of our conversation went to. Yeah, 
<clears throat> no, it's basically, um, it is actually called life, yeah? Something we don't understand anyway. So, but there, there is life uh, that is wanting to express ourselves from, from this big bang to, to now. Um, and, um, and Arnold Mendel calls that process, uh, process psychology of process work. Uh, but it's also with, uh, in Taoism, that's already started. The, the Tao, this, the, the thing that cannot be uh, spoken about, but is there. Um, and, and, and I'm, I'm making the link with, uh, the, the, let's say the, the levers. I assume they have a much better sense or can better feel or they have better intuition. They are more connected with nature. And um, and I think that's maybe what we have lost in the, all, all our uh, uh, rational revolutions. And the thing that struck me about um, Arnold Mandel's quote is his quote is follow the process. But then Frank said, what that means is you're basically following life. So recently I've seen some change theories and things like this that are looking at how do we embed change work under life-giving principles as opposed to control or change from my perspective onto you. And so it made me kind of be thinking about what that, um, what would it look like if these critical processes are all based in life and creating conditions for future life. How many of the ways, uh, Mindel, thank you, how many of the ways that we generally operate and think are normal organizational things that we do have nothing to do with life? You know, traditional agriculture starts from the assumption that the, sto the soil is sterile, it's inert, there's nothing there. So we need to put fertilizer to grow anything. And then we, that attracts pests. And so then we throw more chemical pesticides on it to, um, to diminish that life. And so all of it is life destroying as a life, as, a, as opposed to life giving. So this is a, a very fun conversation, Daniel, thank you. Of course. Um, one thing that was shared uh, around the levers, and this I was listening to a podcast between the connection of biomimicry and traditional ecological knowledge. Are you familiar with that term, T-E-K? It is, it is a Western term to try to explain the science of indigenous people, that they have traditional ecological knowledge that has literally been passed down for thousands of years. And there is a science to that of a deep observation and connection with nature that our modern Western science and the scientific method just hasn't proven their observations in full yet. But it, it, the beautiful thing about that term, even though there's a lot of stupid things that we have to name it that to give it validity, is that it has brought validity to traditional indigenous wisdom. Because when you start to talk about wisdom in the science field, people poo-poo it, right? Oh, that's just an oral story. What does that actually mean? That's anthropology. That's not science. And so when I was reading Ishmael, the concepts of how the levers lived are found in this traditional ecological knowledge. And it still exists, but the, it's much smaller pockets of people who are living in this way. And if we want to go back to how do we live as a lever culture where we're in tune with life there are people doing that today appreciative inquiry would say where what's already working where where in the system is it working and go learn from them learn from that and then replicate it so that's a, another translation if you want to dive into this space a little bit more of what the lever culture is look into traditional ecological knowledge and there's a lot of other ways to talk about that indigenous wisdom and whatnot but that's that's the more westernized term that gives it validity in circles where people might have skepticism of what people have been living in harmony with nature for tens of thousands of years do. One of the things uh, we did as a class is I had the students create a zine and um, they created this little booklet. It's finally, it, 
to come uh, into print a, a rough draft here, a story you might know and the way things have been and the way things could be. And if you'll humor me, I'll just read the end of it. Because it, it basically, it's a telling of the taker myth and human superiority and separateness. And then at the end, the child is asking mother culture. It says, no mother culture. The answers are not far out of reach. There are things we could research and things we could teach. We can live with the earth in harmony. The rest of life does it, and so can we. Mm -hmm. We'll take what we need, but not anything more. We'll study the others who've done it before. We'll learn from the earth, teach a few at a time. Eventually, these ways will spread far and wide. How should we live? We must open our minds. The answers of life are for us to go find. No time to waste, for now I must choose a different life path, or else we'll all lose. And there's some of the illustrations that the students did. <laughs> That's beautiful. So that cool. Great. You know, there's something, Chris, in what you were saying and what you were saying, Daniel, that um, <clears throat> is beginning to run through my mind, and that is nature or the, I'm sorry, the indigenous people who live on an integrated basis with nature, I'm suggesting would not use that terminology. And I think um, they would regard this just from my readings as rather they are a part of nature. It's it's not integral, it's a part of. And it's a spiritual process. Um, I discovered some literature a couple days ago that was very unusual in that it's about African American people and lifelong learning um, and acknowledging what are the motivators for African-American people. And one of the key motivators is spirituality. It was very profound for me because it's that consciousness change that spirituality is not something we do once a week. Um, it's not a place we go to to find. It is very much an embedded part of our being. It's the acknowledgement of its role, as well as the appreciation and acceptance that it's a we rather than integrated, which implies in this sense, separation. Um, and I'm, I'm coming across from our conversation today, as well as that popped out to me the other day, and it caused me to really do some reflection again of that traditional sense. Um, there's an old book called Fool's Crow Speaks, and he was Black Elk's medicine man. And every day he woke up, he walked out, he bowed down to north, south, east, and west because they are us. He is them. And there are no separate entities. Um, this was something that shaped his thought process on a daily basis. I, I just... I'm very, very intrigued at how removed the takers are from what isn't an us and a them or a we and a they or a takers and leavers, but rather is our entire self with a capital S. Right. That's fascinating. I I am reminded that so much of my work in sustainability and climate consulting, a word that resonates with our partners and clients is we will help integrate sustainability and climate action into your organization. 
And the fact that you pointed out that that has a fundamental assumption that we're already separate, that it's not all the way there of the fact that we're all connected. We are nature. Um, right. Now I need to rethink my terminology, but I also wonder too, if that is in a change process, that's a comfortable term to help them move towards connectedness without it's not taking them all the way there. So interesting. Thank you for that. But you know, it's, it's, also interdependency as well as interconnectedness. Um, and we talk about interdependency a lot here, but it's large. <laughs> I believe very strongly that I can't function without, and we're seeing the re repercussions of not functioning interdependently in our world. Um, we can't function without trees, without each other, without animals. Um, we need, I'm trying, I, I don't remember the article that I've read and how we used to think animals could not go to the river and drink because they were ecologically harming, polluting the river with their dung and their hooves and we're now learning that that's an essential part of animal husbandry, that churning up of the earth with their hooves is actually replenishing and continuing to aerate the soil. We didn't design that. We didn't intend that, but we are dependent on it. So that might suggest that we should be, this should be like quantum mechanics that we discover we don't invent it. Mm -hmm. So well, we're I think that's true. Rediscovering Kathy. interdependence, we're re, we're, we're <clears throat> I don't know what the language is, but that's well, really interesting. Christine, we're we're dependent to a point if we understand what the concept of enough is, right? Like the indigenous cultures understood the idea of enough. And um, we come in, Europeans come in and have a class system where there's a bell curve of have and have nots with people who never have enough and those who have too much. And then this monocropping and you know the, the too much, too much, the more, the more, and and um, excess is introduced, and we um, we're out of balance. So, what do you think is at the root of excess? Is it well, spiritual? Is it something else? What's well, what we definitely we're, we, if we're gonna yeah, I mean, we come with this other culture where we have a spiritual balance a different balance, right? Where the, the sort of um, repression of puritanical, puritanical repression, and we're not balanced. <laughs> I mean, we're horrible, we're horrible, we're horrible. You know, it doesn't really do much for um, a sense of well-being and oneness and integrative, you know, mm -hmm. health in the way that the indigenous community was sort of you know, I, I just, I don't think we were set up to succeed, you know, in a, a sense of wholeness and well-being. Um, we came in to tackle hmm. from the start. We came One in of the Go ahead. Thanks, Christine. I, one of the things that comes up for me in response to your question, Kathleen, is um, it, it's like uh, a matter of enculturation. And I don't know if um, any of you have read Monoculture by F.S. Michaels, um, but they talk about um, the monomyth of um, the story of the market and economy as, as central to our time right now. And, and the premise of that economic story is always more. That's how, that's the mm. point of life. And so there is no enough. It's, it's limitless growth. There's no boundary on it. Yeah. And that 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 cancer idea and and 
that limitless growth, by the way, is perpetuated by an invisible hand. I mean, the fact that there's invisible labor making that wheel fly is already flawed. You know, that there's it's a flawed um, formula from the start. And so we're coming in with kind of a flawed spirit and a flawed math and um, a, a, a one up um, perspective. Um, you know, coming in. So, Christine, the counter to that, which I think we forget often, is <clears throat> the so-called lesser developed countries and cultures. I'm picking on um, India and Madagascar because it reminds me that if someone visits, someone... Um, you encounter on a street or what, whatever way you um, interact with another individual. In the traditions in those countries is that person is God. Everything is shared with them, food, house, um, love, it's completely open, accessible, and available. It is who they are mm -hmm. and who we all are. And there is no separation. Yeah. And Mary Ellen, to, to kind of build off that and, and connect it, I, I think, into the premise that um, Michaels might say is like, it's not a matter of um, a spiritual flaw. It's a matter of uh, what story we're telling. Are we and telling us? A... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Are, are we telling a story where, um, you know, the point of this life is to accumulate wealth so we can be happy at the expense of whatever? Um, or is it... Um, to, to know our interrelated, interrelatedness and, and what we have to contribute in, in the web. Chris, when I lived in Minneapolis <clears throat> and for a time worked in the corporate world, at the end of every day when I was riding the elevator um, from the 42nd floor down to the lobby, I had a little exercise that I did with people I'd run into on the elevator this was a a tower of attorneys and finance people and all kinds of different um, corporate people. And I loved to get into the elevator and look at the person next to me and say, and how did you make the world a better place today? <laughs> I did. I did. I had so much fun doing that. Because interestingly enough, I thought was that people would look at me deeply in the eye and they would say, oh, well, oh, well, let me think about that one for a minute. It, it, it What I took from that was that it's there, it's within, but nobody asked them that in a long time. And they were just going by rote through the process. I have to make more money. I have to blah. In this wonderful, sophisticated way that we think we're living in. But in reality, they knew. They knew. And sometimes somebody would say to me, you know, I did actually a good job today. I'm not sure I accomplished anything, but I tried. And, and, you know, I got all kinds of responses, but I did that for a very long time because it was so interesting to me to hear. And, but it was also using my other senses too to see how their eyes changed or their expression or where they looked or whatever, because. I think inherently, it's all still here.
I think that ties into this idea of the mother culture, right? It's the soup that we swim in. And if they're not asked that question on a regular basis, they're not paying attention to it. Things we pay attention to get reinforced. And it, the earlier, I can't remember who was saying that, maybe it was you, Christine, that like, there's the story that we're fundamentally flawed, that why do we want more? Because there's a God-sized hole in our heart. That's just human nature. That's the story. But what if we had a different story that we're whole and complete and part of nature, that we are yeah. nature? Yeah. Does excess, does that story breed excess? Or is, is there something fundamental about human nature that we've decided I mean, is always craving more? You could just look at the photos of the West when the whites come in and kill all the buffalo and those mountains of skulls. And the the culture that that let that happen, that that did that, right? And let that happen. Like the Indians never did that. Wouldn't have even it wouldn't have even occurred to them to kill more than they needed in that in that kind of way right and so they're they're living a different story just i mean that's a perfect example of of what you're talking about right like they just it just the the story wouldn't have allowed that to happen because they have an idea of enough the story that they're living in has a, an idea of enough and and the story that we're living in that we came with has no concept of enough and and that picture sh sh displays that, and okay. and so does monocropping, and so does the way we handle human resources and the way that we push people through. We monocrop our human resources, we monocrop our crops, we monocrop data. We're doing it with AI. I mean, everything. There's no enough. <clears throat> oh, and that, everything's endless. So that that causes Definitely. me to ask myself the question. Um, how do we change the story and start talking about what we want and focusing on that? There's um, a, a, a um, Native American story about the wolf you feed gets stronger. Uh, and um, mm -hmm. so you can go to my website and uh, there, I wrote a blog on it and it has the story embedded in the blog, but it's, uh, uh, you know, how do we, what if we just did what Mary Ellen played with, you know, where we started challenging the assumptions underneath the story, or we started telling an alternative story in, com in uh, complement to the story that we think is happening in our course or our classroom or our team or organization um what would what would happen if we just started there i think there are starting stories um and i yeah steph that's what i'm thinking is the Native American tribes, those that have a great deal of wealth, like the Midwakatan Sioux in Minnesota, are buying up land around the United States very quietly. Thousands and thousands of acres. And then they just hold it. Nothing gets built. Nothing gets developed. They're just, it's there. And it's back to its original intent um, in their perception. And I look now at the culture in the Southeast, which is acknowledging and trying to share on an ever deeper basis the culture of the Golo people and the culture of the Native Americans here. Um, that is not, <laughs> not something that has been done in the southeastern part of the United States. And um, I would venture very carefully to guess that that's by intent. <clears throat> but here we are. And it's not a huge and obvious um, view at this point, but it's increasing. 
I think even of things like the Smithsonian's collection of American stories, as they travel around the country and they ask perfectly ordinarily, ordinary people to talk about different aspects of their life or their ancestors, and they're just preserving them, making them available to people, um, but nonetheless, keeping them so that we can better understand the lives of how people live and what that means to them. I think mm -hmm. that's particularly a beautiful example to me when I think of all of its implications. It's not suggesting anyone is better than or has more than. It's simply who we are and who we are to each other. And what's the relationship we have? Um, I, that... I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off. I want to be oh, mindful of the world yeah. of time that we live in. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a delightful mm. uh, journey into assumptions that underpin the life that we're swimming in and different ways of thinking and challenging those and remembering and rediscovering that the answers are around us that we can live and create this story and we need to name it. The story that we tell is this is what, or the Kathy wrote, when we change our story, we change our lives. Right. And this last hour has been a part of that remembering, rediscovering and changing our lives and how we're going to show up in the world and the words we're going to use and the stories we're going to tell. So thank you for letting Ishmael be a jumping off point um, to this bigger conversation. And I love, Chris, that you have a class that's reading this book and that you were able to even dive in in a deeper way because you're in the middle of it yourself. So it's 2 p.m. Central Time, lots of other different times, depending where you are in the world, in a European time zones or U.S. I don't think we have any other continents um, represented today. Sometimes we have Australia. Um, and as Kathy said, our next one is going to be March 16th uh, with Helen uh, Sirodi talking about the integration of inner development goals and how they complement the UN's sustainability goals uh, and the work that she's been experimenting with in her Wise Goose consulting practice. So same time, uh, 1 p.m. Central, same Zoom link. If you're on the email list, you'll get a reminder of that. But thank you all for enriching my life today and helping me shift the cultural story. Yeah, wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Be well. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you.